Hi everyone and welcome to everyone at home for joining us this evening. My name's Ali Boyle, I'm Keeper of Science Collections at the Science Museum and I'm very happy to present tonight's virtual event. This is the last in a series held in collaboration with the Royal Society. It's featured lots of brilliant speakers including AC Grayling, Hayatin Salem, Angela Sini and Patricia Farah to name just a few. So this event series celebrates our gallery Science City 1550 to 1800, the Linbury Galleries, which opened in autumn 2019. The galleries tell the story of how over how 250 years London grew from a modest commercial centre to a world city and a leading centre of science. And the gallery unites three extraordinary collections, the Science Museum's own scientific instrument collections, the exquisite King George III collection on loan from King's College London and objects and artworks from our friends at the Royal Society. These incredible objects in the collection reveal how in this period science shaped London and London shaped science. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about tonight. So tonight we'll see a format of a series of videos filmed on gallery by our brilliant curator, Alex Rose. And she's going to show us some of the fantastic objects in the gallery on display. Then we're going to hear from our three special guest speakers who will shed some light on some of the interesting stories connected to the objects that you're going to see this evening. I have the pleasure of introducing the speakers to you now. So firstly, I'm joined by Keith Moore. Keith has been the Royal Society's librarian since the 4th of July, 2005. So we believe that he celebrates this date every year with fireworks. Welcome, Keith. <laughs> uh, we're joined by Dr. Philippa Hallowell, who's an early modern record specialist, particularly on the 18th century, the period we're talking about this evening at the National Archives. Good evening, Philippa. Um, and last but certainly not least, we have Professor Simon Schaffer, Professor of History of Science in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Cambridge. Thanks for joining, Simon. Um, so warm welcome to all of you. Looking forward to chatting. Um, we're going to kick off proceedings first with our Science City lead curator, Alex Rose. Over to Alex. I'm standing in front of an air pump that was used um, for experimental demonstrations at the Royal Society. This one was made in 1708, and you can see that we've displayed it in a scene sort of suggesting how it might have been at the heart of the Royal Society's meetings. You can see it's got a, a glass chamber at the top into which uh, the Royal Society Fellows could put any kind of specimen that they might want to experiment on, so a candle, a glass of beer, something that they wanted to set fire to, for example. And then when your specimen was ready, you would crank the handle um, and extract the air from the glass chamber, so creating something approaching a vacuum. And then the Fellows would observe what happened. So there's a watch, so they might have timed things that happened. Weighing scales so that they could weigh uh, the specimen before and after. And then we can see somebody very diligently and carefully recording what they saw, which was a really important part of Royal Society demonstrations. The Royal Society's meetings were a really important site of scientific activity and discussion in London. However, it was only quite an exclusive group of people who could be in the room when the demonstrations were taking place. As you're about to discover, there were lots of other spaces around London where people could learn about the latest scientific activity. Thanks, Alex. So you'll get a chance to see from Alex again later in the evening. Um, but now we're going to be joined by Professor Simon Schaffer, who's going to talk to us about another space in London where people were discussing scientific ideas, specifically London's many coffee houses. So, Simon, what do we mean by coffee houses in this period? What were they and when did they appear in London? So they were um, remarkable and new kinds of spaces. Um, the very first coffee houses uh, started in London in the 1650s. London was at the cutting edge of the coffee house trade. They were dark, candlelit, smoky. Um, they were lively, sometimes raucous. It was allegedly hard to get yourself heard. And above all, why we're thinking about them is that they were places for exchange. They were places for commerce and they were places for show. It's very clear from contemporary reports from century and early 18th century London that coffee houses were not just places for coffee and chat, they were also places where you could make money and they even had a function as a museum or an exhibition, as we'll soon find out. So it sounds like there was all kinds of different types of people there then. I mean, how, how, did, how did you get to go? Could anyone go to one of these places or? That's right. I mean, what Alex pointed out just then, 
the, the Royal Society meetings themselves were relatively exclusive. The coffee houses were understood as being relatively inclusive. Um, and that gave them an edge. They were seen by many as being somewhat subversive, even treasonable. Um, so one of the priests who preached in front of King Charles II at Whitehall explicitly said that mixing superiors and inferiors in coffee houses was a dangerous recipe for treason. And indeed, in 1675, the government tried and dismally failed to have them suppressed, partly for that reason. That was an attempt that lasted exactly two weeks before the coffee house owners' lobby managed to keep the coffee houses open. Um, it's also, I think, fascinating when we're thinking about experimental philosophy, the Royal Society demonstrations at this period, that the coffee houses were an extraordinarily important site of news. So newspapers and print at that time were called paper fuel for the coffee houses. Um, you paid a penny to sit in, right? Glorious English tradition of paying a penny to absorb and expel liquid. And what went along with that was debate so that new phenomena literally news such as news of the phenomena demonstrated at the royal society would foment discussion within the coffee houses um so so in terms of drawing that out more about you know how people would hear about the royal society um but also there were experiments and demonstrations that happened at these coffee houses themselves that's exactly right. Um, it's extremely significant that even before the foundation of the Royal Society, um, there had been coffee houses from the start of the 1650s. One of the most interesting was not in London, but in Oxford at the apothecaries Arthur Tilliards on High Street in Oxford. And it was there at Tilliards that one of the groups who would be responsible for founding the Royal Society, including Robert Boyle and others, had originally met. So that relation between demonstration, discussion and sociability had already been laid down even before the Society began in 1660. And then from the 1660s onwards, it's very clear that what had been shown at the Society, which was meeting over at Gresham College and then after the Great Fire at Arundel House on the Strand, what had been shown there would then be reported and sometimes replicated in these coffee houses at Jonathan's, Garraway's, Child's, and so on. And these would range from demonstrations of anatomy a deeply unhygienic coffee house performance, including uh, perhaps my favorite example, uh, what happened in the end of 1666, the Royal Society um, had attempted on at least two occasions to transfuse the blood of a lamb into the bloodstream of a human, a Cornishman called Arthur Koga. Um, who obviously had quite a lot to drink during and after the event. And Koga would then retire to the coffee house and be quizzed by uh, drinkers and gentlemen in the coffee house about what he'd experienced and how he was feeling. And on one occasion, he said reportedly to the group, who was looking at him with presumably startled attention. Well, there is a similarity between the blood of the lamb and the blood of Christ. I have in that sense, he explained, been saved. There were also demonstrations of the air pump that we've just seen. Um, we've just been shown by Alex Francis Hawksby's early 18th century air pump um, that kind of device was shown in the early 1700s in London coffee houses. So were Isaac Newton's optical experiments with prisms and lenses. This was really major public knowledge on show. 
Um, and so you've mentioned some of the um, some of the individuals whose work might have been discussed at the coffee houses. Do we know if any notable in individuals frequented the coffee houses? Do we have them on record? Well, the uh, by far, I think the most enthusiastic habitué was Robert Hooke. Um, Hooke kept a diary. Uh, we have uh, very substantial sections of it, um, and he went to a coffee house every day during the 1670s, sometimes more than one. There are over 60 different coffee houses listed in his diaries. And he would use the coffee houses not only to learn information about schemes and devices that were on the market, but also to advertise his own worth. He did not have a private income. In that respect, he was rather different from some of the other senior members of the Royal Society. And we have records, for example, of Hook talking in detail in the coffee houses in the 1670s with men like Thomas Tompion, who was the designer of the clock that we saw on show in gallery next to the air pump. That device was exactly the kind of device that Hook and his colleagues would have discussed and indeed disassembled and reassembled, no doubt, um, around the tables of the London coffee houses. Um, and so I think that's a point that I'd just like to, to draw out a bit more, that the coffee houses were not just a place for disseminating inquiry. And the coffee houses were where inquiry was happening. They the, 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 the coffee houses had a huge influence on scientific thinking during this period. I think that's spot on. I mean, one of the more important features of what was called the new philosophy was that it advertised itself as public. And it did so for a number of reasons. One reason, rather obviously, was that its promoters advertised it as useful, as capable of transforming everyday life. Um, and protagonists like Robert were very keen on emphasizing the application of apparently abstract knowledge to the purposes of the arts and the improvement of social welfare. On the other hand, um, the public sphere, which in large measure the coffee houses certainly represent, was also the site where knowledge could be established. Men like Boyle and Hooke argued loud and long for the extraordinarily significant principle that for a knowledge claim to be accepted, it has to be witnessed. And for it to be witnessed, one had to see uh, directly and experience directly the experiment or the device that had been discussed, the very motto of the Royal Society on no one's word, nullius in verba, pointed towards the significance that the society was giving towards immediate experience. Now, obviously this wasn't always delivered. It wasn't always possible. It didn't always work. Um, nevertheless, the entanglement in the new philosophy and the system of debate and demonstration of news and discussion, and at least the in principle claim of an open public sphere that could bring the capacity to witness and validate what was being shown. That was that claim was absolutely fundamental to the new kind of experimental philosophy that was being pursued. Um, and and in that, so you you've mentioned some of the. Um the witnessing of experiments. Um, can you give us some more examples of some other kinds of experiments that might have happened at the coffee houses? Yes, I mean, one example, I've mentioned it briefly, is the uh, project around Isaac Newton's work on light and color. Um, Isaac Newton lived in Cambridge until the middle of the 1690s, where he visited London uh, on several occasions. By 1703, he'd become president of the Royal Society immediately following the death of Robert Hooke, perhaps significantly. And uh, once 
presiding over the affairs of the society, um, he employed demonstrators to show his experiment at meetings of the Royal Society. These were men like Francis Hawksby or John Desagulier. Now, what's absolutely fascinating is that Hawksby, Desagulier, and their collaborators in the London of Queen Anne worked at the Royal Society, to be sure, but they simultaneously spent a great deal of time at coffee houses giving lectures on the new philosophy, um, notably on Newtonian sciences. So that for the first time, it was again, at least in principle possible to see the machines, the astronomical models, the prisms and lenses on which Newton's scientific achievements were based. We have testimony, which is fascinating, from foreign visitors to London from the late 1600s, but notably the early 1700s, who would tour coffee houses precisely in order to see these demonstrations and at least again in principle learn the recipes from which these experiments could at least in principle be replicated elsewhere so this is making knowledge and transmitting it in these perhaps slightly surprising settings so we need to think of coffee houses as multi-purpose sites some of them became extremely famous extremely famous because as i uh, in indicated it wasn't just a question of exchange of information it was a question of exchange of commerce and probably in the end the most important of all the coffee houses was lloyd's uh, lloyd's which was so uh, closely linked with marine trade and insurance and survives as Lloyd's Insurance. Um, that reminds us of the commercial, financial, business basis of the new public knowledge of the early to mid 18th century. Um, and on that, one, one of the points that we make in the gallery is that London at this point is it, it's not a university city when it starts you know it's a commercial city it's very much commercial needs is there um and you've mentioned people coming from abroad to visit the coffee houses now presumably there are coffee house cultures elsewhere but is there something distinctive going on about London's would you say or is it I think that's um, a very interesting question it's important to remember that um within living memory for the generations of the mid 1600s london had not been the dominant and vast city that it was rapidly becoming um so that the extraordinary increase and intensity of population and trade is very very new so is the financial domination of the city um the establishment of the Bank of England, of uh, that indispensable part of British financial triumph, the national debt um, in the 1690s, all of that can be closely linked to coffee house society, and I think pretty directly to the functioning of the scientific networks that we're talking about so by the early 1700s yes i think one can say that coffee house society in london was understood as something idiosyncratic um indeed there's a great deal of evidence that the coffee houses that opened in london from the 1650s and 60s were among the very first in western europe um coffee was turkish and coffee houses were the institutions of Istanbul. And uh, in order to understand their establishment in London in the 17th century, you have to understand the immense importance of what was called the Levant trade, the links between London and the Turkish trade and trade further to the east. The very first coffee house in London 
uh, was actually established by a Turkish trader, Pasquale Rosi, um, and his collaborators. So this is an international network with a very interesting London bias, I think. And by the middle of our period, by say the 1720s and 30s, that set of networks is understood very widely, both as an indispensable part of the new science and as an indispensable part of the new financial and economic system, which began to have London at, at its centre. Brilliant. Thanks, Simon. Um, so don't go away. I'm going to be chatting with you again shortly. Um, but now we're going to hear from Alex um, a little bit about two of the people who Simon has mentioned. Um, so we're going to talk about some objects in our gallery related to Newton and Hooke. Robert Hooke was what was known as the curator of experiments at the Royal Society during its early years. One of the areas of scientific inquiry that he was particularly interested in was microscopy, and he worked with his extensive network of artisans across London to construct the instruments that he needed for his research. This microscope that we have on display is believed to have been owned by Robert Hooke, and it was made by the optical instrument maker Christopher Koch. Hook studied a, a broad range of different kinds of specimens um, under his microscope, from snowflakes to ants to fleas. And he wrote up and, and published his research in a book that he called Micrographia, which was published in 1665. Hook's training uh, as an artist in the early years of his career is really clear um, through these illustrations as well as creating a record of what he saw through the lens of his microscope, Hooke was also creating works of persuasion about the power of this instrument to reveal new truths about the natural world. In Cambridge, the mathematician Isaac Newton was also investigating optical phenomena. Amongst his most famous discoveries is the fact that when you pass white light through a prism, it splits into its constituent colours, what we now know as wavelengths of light. This had a really important implication for the construction of scientific instruments. As Newton pointed out, refracting telescopes which used lenses to collect and focus light um, could never focus all of the different colours of light to the same point. Newton suggested using a curved mirror to collect and reflect the light. Newton wasn't the first person to suggest this, but he was the first person to construct a, a practical device that worked along these lines and you can see his reflecting telescope on display in the gallery. Even though Hooke and Newton were investigating broadly similar topics, it's fair to say that they didn't always agree on their findings. Um, so thanks, Alex, for that another view of the gallery. Some fantastic objects there, some of which are on loan from our friends at the Royal Society. Um, and we're now going to be joined by Keith Moore, who is head librarian at the Royal Society. Um, so, Keith, Alex alluded to Newton and Hooke having a complicated relationship. Could you tell us a bit more about how they came into contact and what their relationship was like? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, initially, they would have uh, come into contact uh, in print uh, and through manuscripts, through, through correspondence. Um, Newton would have known works in chemistry by uh, Hooke's early patron, Robert Boyle. And uh, of course, Micrographia, as uh, was mentioned there, was published in 1665. And the book contains a lot more than just microscope observations. It has Hooke's uh, commentary on, on lots and lots of topics, including uh, astronomy, for example. Um, similarly, Hooke would have known Newton through his writings by the 1670s, and this would be letters sent to the Royal Society. So Hooke was curator of experiments at the Royal Society uh, from the 1660s. And um, as a recognized authority on optical matters, when Newton first began to write to the Royal Society on uh, his telescope and particularly on his ideas about light and colours. Uh, it was Hooke who was asked to, to comment upon these uh, materials. And um, initially, Hooke was perhaps less than flattering towards uh, uh, Newton's uh, ideas, the, the initial light and colours paper. Um, and uh, it wasn't until 1675 when Newton eventually came to London 
uh, and attended a meeting at the Royal Society uh, that the two men would have would have met. Um, and so um, you've you've n noted there that Hook was um, perhaps a little skeptical of some of some Newton's writings. I mean, how much how much did they differ in terms of scientific ideas? Um, I guess that the kind of disputes between them were, were both scientific and personal. Um, so one of the things that Hooke picks, picks up on, on Newton's uh, uh, initial letter is that um, he, he believes that Newton is putting forward a, a theory of light that involves particles, and, and Hooke disagrees with this. And um, th there's, a, there's a little correspondence about this. Um, the Fellows of the Royal Society, I think, realize at the time that there's uh, territory here that they need to be careful about. So um, Isaac Newton's letter on light and colours is published by the Royal Society in the Philosophical Transactions. Uh, Hooke's commentary on it is, is also published, but, but slightly later, uh, the idea being that uh, um, uh, Newton wouldn't perhaps be offended by this. I think the personalities of each of them was um, interesting. Uh, um, they could be quite touchy characters. Uh, Newton certainly argued with many scientists during his lifetime. Uh, Robert Hooke, uh, perhaps because he was a, a paid employee of the Royal Society and in a slightly different position from Isaac Newton, um, could be very touchy about matters of precedent. In other words, uh, quite often you find Hooke reacting to people in terms of, of publishing where uh, he would assert that he'd had a particular idea first. Very often he was right, of course, uh, but, but sometimes maybe he just claimed a little bit too much. Uh, and therefore, uh, the, the scene was set for, for them to perhaps rub each other the wrong way. Um, and as well as personalities, I mean, that they would have had different kinds of backgrounds in education? Um, slightly different backgrounds, but quite often the things that said about uh, Newton and, and Hooke are, are surprisingly similar in, in the early days. Uh, so uh, Robert Hooke is from the Isle of Wight, uh, Newton is, is from uh, Woolsthorpe, Lincolnshire. Um, Accounts of their, their childhoods uh, in both cases state that they uh, were interested in mechanical matters. They created mechanical toys, things like clocks and, and boats. Um, Newton would eventually attend Cambridge uh, University. Hook spent time in Oxford. Uh, Newton would become the Lucasian professor at Cambridge University. Uh, Hooke uh, was employed by the Royal Society, uh, but he was also a Cutlerian lecturer and he would become a professor of geometry at Gresham College in London. So to an extent, they, they tracked uh, careers a little, um, uh, but uh, they diverted as well, I think. So Hooke, uh, in the earliest days of the Royal Society, does become an established scientist. I mean, he's he's a known person in and around London. Uh, as uh, Simon has been saying, he frequented coffee houses. Uh, he he was known in London society. Newton tended to be rather more private, and um, spent his time on personal researchers. He, he was known to a few people in and around Cambridge and, and his ideas circulated a little, but it wasn't until the 1670s that he became a little better known, certainly in Royal Society circles. Um, now, of course, Newton would go on to become president of the Royal Society. Um, and after Hooke's death, how would you say his legacy might have been impacted by Newton's presidency? Um, I think they, they both had a substantial impact on the Royal Society. Um, Robert Hooke, uh, as curator of experiments, and then uh, from the later 1670s as, as secretary, um, uh, really uh, kept the Royal Society going. He, he had an enormous amount of energy. He was very creative. And... Um, uh, a lot of that kept the Royal Society uh, working. Um, when he died, Newton becomes president. As president, uh, Newton 
very quickly takes control of matters at the Royal Society. He certainly helps to sort out its finances. Uh, he brings in some of his own people as demonstrators, as Simon was saying. And uh, although he hadn't really taken that much notice of the Royal Society's regular meetings before that, um, as president, he does become a regular attender. He chairs meetings and um, uh, lends his by then quite famous name to the organization. Um, Newton, as president, is a big figure, and uh, he's uh, eventually known across Europe, of course. Um, and um, his reputation helps the Royal Society. I mean, I think it's very significant that after Newton dies, uh, the presidency of the Royal Society becomes contested. Uh, whereas before that, quite a few people had refused the presidency of the Royal Society, but people wanted to follow in Newton's footsteps. And, and, and that was quite a significant thing for the organization. Um, and so we, we all have, um... You know, Newton is very well known today, of course, and we have this uh, the wonderful portrait of him that's on display in the gallery. Now, we don't know what Hook looked like, do we? Um, we don't. Is, there is are... there, there's a story as to why there aren't portraits of him. Is, is there any truth to that? Oh, you, you're referring to the, the, the portrait that Newton allegedly destroyed. Uh, not true, unfortunately. <laughs> there are, there are um, written descriptions of, of Robert Hook. Uh, his his biographer Richard Wallach gives quite a famous one, uh, but there is a story that has, has circulated, uh, which is a bit like the the apple tree story of, of gravity. You know, it's a good story, therefore surely it must be true uh, that Newton destroyed a, a portrait of Robert Hooke, uh, owned by the Royal Society. Uh, it's not true. Uh, uh, there was a German uh, philosopher von Uffenbach, Uffenbach who uh, allegedly saw a portrait of, of uh, Hook at the Royal Society in 1710. Uh, it, it's quite likely to have been a misunderstanding so that he was shown a, a portrait of Mr. Hack, Theodore Hack, rather than Mr. Hook, Robert Hook. Um, there's no uh, evidence in the Royal Society's records that a portrait ever existed, and uh, our records are, are pretty good on that kind of area. Um, Hook did know artists, of course, he trained as an, an artist himself very briefly. Um, but it's remarkable, too, I think, that there are no drawings of the Royal Society's meetings in operation. You, you would have thought that surely some fellow of the Royal Society would have, have sketched the Royal Society in action, but no. Uh, and in just the same way, as far as we know, uh, there's no portrait of Robert Hook. Great, thanks. Um, and can you tell us a bit more? You, you, uh, so Hook was curator of experiments. Can you, can you describe what that role was? What did that mean at the time? Um, he was appointed um, curator of experiments from 1662. Uh, previously, Hook had, had worked for Robert Boyle. Um, the, the fellows in their early days decided that they would like to have demonstrations at the Royal Society's week, weekly meetings, and they levied a fee of sixpence from the fellows to try to uh, get that going. Hook was the person who would do those demonstrations, so he would, uh, on, a, on a good day, on a good weekly meeting, perhaps do three or four demonstrations, uh, perhaps slightly less, and um, these would be to partly to entertain the fellows but also to, to illustrate uh, material that had come in by letter. Um, uh, one of the famous demonstrations or observations at the Royal Society uh, was to um, uh, was in reaction to Anthony van Leeuwenhoek's uh, microscope uh, uh, letters. Again, coming in in the 1670s, uh, those observations were repeated at the Royal Society as a means of verifying what Anthony van was, uh, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek was saying. Um, so, so Hook conducted uh, those uh, observations or experiments uh, within the Royal Society, and no doubt, as Simon was saying, they would have been talked about afterwards at coffee houses and uh, in other venues in and around London. Um, so, you've talked a bit there about the the different kinds of roles that Hook and Newton played. Um, now, Newton went on to become a household name. I mean, we, we would say at the Science Museum, there aren't that many scientists that most of our visitors can name drop. Newton is one of the few. 
Hook sadly is somewhat less well remembered today, although we're hoping that um, the gallery will do something to redress that. Um, what today would be the view of the Royal Society's view of the legacy of these two men? I'm asking you to speak on behalf of the whole Royal Society there. But... Oh, well, easy, yeah. Um, uh, I mean, in the way they, they were both great scientists, and, and it's, it's slightly unfortunate, I guess, on Hook that he's not associated with a single great idea or big invention. And, and quite often scientists are remembered for precisely this reason, you know, for, for splitting the atom, discovering penicillin. There's, there's one thing that, that ensures that their name uh, becomes public property. Uh, with Newton, I guess it's gravity, although he did lots of other things. Uh, the Principia Mathematica, of course, is his great book. Uh, the Optics, uh, another one, both published by the Royal Society. Um, Hook, uh, I think, I mean, in a way, he, he was almost too good. He had too many ideas. He, he followed too many different paths. He had lots and lots of different inventions. Um, Newton, as a scientist, he tended to um, look at one area, whether it was alchemy, uh, whether it was uh, the physical sciences, uh, even into theology. He, he would delve into a subject in enormous amounts of detail. He would really master something. And, and mathematics is, of course, another one. Uh, he would master a topic and, and then extend it. Um, in, the, in, in both cases, you know, these are scientists who made a big impact on the Royal Society, uh, but also a, a far wider world. Uh, Newton is the one that's known. Hooke really deserves to be better known as well, I think. Great, thank you. Um, and in that, I mean, I guess, you know, part of what Hook is so, so influential for is that experimental culture, is that witnessing culture, is the Royal Society, you know, fundamentally integrated with the city. Um, and Simon has mentioned the idea that the Royal Society's knowledge and this new philosophy had to be useful. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about that, the idea that this was useful knowledge and how members of the society might have been involved in some of the practical side of London? Sure. Yeah. I mean, the um, we we possibly think of science as, as as blue sky these days, but the Royal Society was certainly created w with one eye on uh, being useful uh, and being able to to make science pay. Um, and uh, part of the reason for that is because they were appealing to the new monarch, Charles II. Uh, and of course, Charles was always short of money. He was always interested in, in making money. And uh, the Royal Society consistently sold itself as, as something that might be useful in that respect. So when Thomas Spratt writes his history of the Royal Society in 1667, uh, this is one of the claims that the Royal Society makes, that, that it will be uh, a useful organization and it will, will add to the Commonwealth. Um, so the early Royal Society isn't just interested in what we would consider to be science now. Uh, the first book published by the Royal Society is, is by John Evelyn. It's silver. It's on forest trees. Uh, and that idea of, of, of husbandry uh, and forestry is part of the early Royal Society project. They had committees looking at mechanical matters, agricultural matters, and, and many of the things that we would not necessarily associate immediately with science. But it's the kind of thing that would appeal to aristocratic patrons of the Royal Society, perhaps, who had landed estates, certainly to the monarch, and it was a means of demonstrating the utility of science. Great. Thank you, Keith. Um, I think it's fair to say we've only scratched the surface of some of the stories of the Royal Society in the short time we have tonight. Um, I hope that's inspired some of you to find out more and also some of the perhaps less well-known names um, from the Royal Society through the years. We're now going to move on to our third presentation of the evening from Alex Rose, who we're going to hear from again in our Science City Gallery. The Great Fire started on the 2nd of September 1666 after a hot, dry summer. Fires were quite common in the capital, where lots of the buildings were made of wood, but this one was particularly devastating. It destroyed four-fifths of the buildings within um, the city walls, including over 13,000 homes, churches, livery halls, the Royal Exchange, and significantly, St Paul's Cathedral. And you can see on these stones the sort of pinkish tinge of the fire damage. 
Some of the Royal Society's fellows, including Christopher Wren and John Evelyn, proposed new layouts for the city, although London was essentially rebuilt um, on the same structure as it was previously. As well as the new St Paul's Cathedral, designed by Christopher Wren, there was another striking new addition to the city as it was rebuilt after the fire. This was the monument, which was designed by Robert Hooke, the monument was designed not just to be a monument to the fire, but to be used as a scientific instrument. There was a chamber at the bottom of the structure um, that Robert Hooke used to lie in in an observing chair, and he would look straight up the, the hollow column of the monument, using it as a giant telescope to observe the passage of the stars overhead. In practice, even then, there was too much vibration from passing traffic for the monument to be particularly effective as a telescope. However, Several fellows of the Royal Society used it for other kinds of scientific experiment. Using a portable barometer, they conducted experiments into air pressure, seeing how much air pressure varied um, according to height by taking observations at different points in the monument. In terms of the scientific legacy of the Great Fire, it says a great deal about the status of London as a science city that a massive scientific instrument was constructed right at the commercial heart of the city. So thank you, Alex, again for uh, some fantastic objects from the gallery. So really striking there are the objects associated with the Great Fire of London. Um, we're going to hear more about that now from Dr. Philippa Hellowell, who's an early modern record specialist at the National Archives. So welcome, Philippa. Um, so for those watching at home tonight, um, I think a lot of people have heard of the Great Fire of London, but not might be not sure exactly of the details. Can you tell us a bit more about how and where it started and how extensive the damage was? Yeah, absolutely. So as Alex said, the fire began in Pudding Lane on the 2nd of September in 1666, and it raged for five days before being brought under control. And despite there being various different conspiracy theories on the cause of the fire, it's actually thought to have begun in the bakery of a man called Thomas Farriner in the early hours of the morning. And this was likely caused by a spark from his, his oven falling onto a pile of fuel nearby. And We've got to imagine the area around Pudding Lane. You know, this is full of warehouses containing highly flammable things like timber, rope and oil. So you can imagine how quick the fire can spread. You know, once you also add to that the climatic conditions, you know, this was a very dry, coming out very dry summer and quite strong winds, which are facilitating the spread of the fire from house to house through the narrow streets of the city. So it's thought that Thomas Farriner, the baker and his family, had to actually climb out of their upstairs window and onto their neighbour's roofs in order, to, in order to, to escape the flames. And we've also got to remember that in this period, there is no organised fire service and or fire brigade. So the chief ways of putting out a fire were through dampening the fire with buckets of water, hoses, pumps and or various different types of water engines and also which seems quite quite drastic and dramatic pulling down houses with things called fire hooks and and the rationale behind that was to prevent the spread of the fire from property to property but as you can imagine a fire can advance quite quickly in these conditions and just to run over some of the statistics that Alex said this this amounted to damage of four-fifths of the city of London you know within uh, the walls uh, and that included 13,200 homes 52 livery company halls, 87 churches, numerous warehouses, and many important buildings like the Royal Exchange and, and St. Paul's Cathedral. I think what is quite notable is that there weren't a high number of deaths recorded. Only six deaths were recorded, but there were likely many more. These are only the official statistics. And as well as, as the damage, we've also got to think about the degree of displacement as well. So this also leaves thousands of people homeless, uh, people living in, in temporary structures or tents on, on Lincoln's Inns fields or, or in Islington. And there's quite a lot of humanitarian concern around this and efforts to provide the most needy with food and shelter. And at the National Archives, we actually have the registers of the Privy Council and the Privy Council is the King's small circle of advisors. And, and it actually showed the, the Crown's initial response and how they directed men and resources to help with the efforts to, distinguish, to extinguish the fire. And also how they issued directives to local parishes to send food to, to the London markets and, and also to decree that the most needy, so the old and the infirm and also women who were pregnant would be, would be temporarily housed. Uh, and I think also when we 
think about you know how long it took to rebuild the area that also reflects on just how extensive the damage was it took about 50 years to rebuild the burnt area of london and, and saint paul's cathedral this kind of phoenix rising from the ashes was not completed until 1711. um and in that so um saint paul's cathedral the phoenix ri rising from the ashes is, is famously mm. associated with christopher wren um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us about what kinds of roles fellows of the Royal Society, such as Wren mm -hmm. and Hook, played in the rebuilding of London? Yeah, they played very substantial roles. Um, you know, within a week, Wren presented his new designs to King Charles II, uh, and he actually did that without formally consulting the other fellows of the Royal <coughs> Society, which was an anno annoyance. Um, and two days later, Evelyn, also a fellow of the Royal Society, that's John Evelyn, who also wrote a, a less famous diary to his contemporary Samuel Pepys. Um, uh, he also travelled to, to Whitehall for, for a royal audience with his own city plans. And th the plans themselves are, are, are very interesting. They've, they've been uh, of interest to a lot of kind of architectural historians and, and also people musing about how London could have looked very differently if, if these plans had been followed. Um, so Christopher Wren's plan, um, this was, he, he imagined London as a capital full of these kind of long, wide boulevards, these grand civic spaces and plazas and, and, and radial street patterns, a city that would really rival Paris for, for its elegance. And, and Wren had actually visited Paris only the year before. And, and, and Wren's, uh, sorry, Evelyn's designs are also quite similar uh, to Wren's, um, if less detailed. Um, but um, they, they weren't the only plans that were presented. There were others imagined a more uniform and navigable city, which was built on a grid system um, that would become more pr prevalent in the United States. And they came from a variety of different people, from the draftsman Richard Newcomb, but also Robert Hook submitted a design as well uh, and a man called Valentine Knight who um, makes for quite an, an interesting story he got into trouble by proposing a design and suggesting that King Charles II could benefit financially from this design by imposing taxes on goods that were imported on a new proposed canal way in his uh, plan um, what is interesting is, you know, as um, Alex said, is that these um, plans weren't really followed and, and the city was very much rebuilt, rebuilt you know, according to um, the, the old um, the old kind of city plan. But as well as just thinking about the design of London, you know, people like Wren and Evelyn, well, Wren and Hook in particular, were involved in the kind of practical, you know, rebuilding of the city as well. Um, and they were part of the commission um, uh, for rebuilding London. So shortly after um, the fire, only in February 16, 1667, we have the Act for Rebuilding London. And this sets up a rebuilding commission composed of six men, and three of these men were appointed by the Crown, uh, and that included Christopher Wren, and three were chosen by the city, and that included uh, Robert Hook. And this commission was charged with managing the, the survey of all the property that had been left derelict, uh, attending to the new building and what kind of form uh, they would they would take, and, and thinking about modifications to the streets. There's lots of kind of, you know, political and practical um, decisions that need to be make, but to be made. But really, I think, you know, Hook and Wren's role is quite significant. And between them, they gave approval to effectively the majority of the rebuilding work. And during that process, you know, they have quite a close association as well. So Hook's diary mentions Wren in very large numbers of entries in connection with both architectural and scientific matters and often meeting in some of their favorite coffee houses that, that Simon mentioned like Jonathan's uh, or, or Garraway's um, and as, as you mentioned Wren's known for being the architect of St Paul's Cathedral but there's also you know 51 other churches that he also designed Hook played a central role in the design and rebuilding of dozens of public buildings and city churches such as St Martin's on, on Ludgate Hill and so really I think when you walk around London you know it, you still see their legacy. It's still testament to their vision and their skill um, and, and their management of, of trying to build London out of the ashes. Um, and I think with that, I was I was near the monument the other week, and it is just so staggering to think there is a giant scientific instrument there. And <laughs> and you know, and it's certainly something most people walk by, rushing out of the tube, mm. and don't really, I think, perhaps know what's there. Um, and could you tell us a little bit more about, you know, the importance of mathematical techniques in, in the rebuilding mm. of the city? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like St. Paul's is a great example, really, um, especially when thinking about the dome and the different mathematical ideas which were behind it. And, and, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. I think, but also I want to just talk about kind of cathedrals in general that really, you know, St. Paul's is a triumph in many ways, but it's also important to marvel on the on cathedrals as structures and, and the wide range of skills and expertise that are necessary to build them. And so we're not just talking about, you know, the vision of the architect, but also the various engineers, the stonemasons, carpenters builders and they all played their part and and this is true for you know the magnificent medieval cathedrals you know that predate St Paul's too um, but St Paul's is you know very interesting we can see the importance and the application of, of, of mathematical ideas that were developing at the time um, and I think the dome is a really great example so the dome of St Paul's is actually made up of three domes uh, the dome that you see from the outside is spherical in shape and a, a sphere was thought to have that kind of beauty and perfection about it, especially when you see it from a distance. But the shape also tapped into that idea of the church representing the, the shape of the, of the cosmos too. But when you actually go into St. Paul's Cathedral, you know, the dome that you from inside is not the inside of the, of the external dome. What you see is a second dome, which shape is made up from a curve called the catenary curve. And this is the shape that a chain makes when you hold it at both ends, so sometimes like a, like a low dip. Uh, and the term derived from catena, the Latin for chain. And so the, the outer dome that the sphere is seen, although it has aesthetic advantage, it's actually quite a weak structure and it could not hold the weight that was required. Um, and so the design of this second dome was actually influenced by some of Robert Hooke's thinking into what made the perfect masonry arch. And he, he came to the conclusion that it was this shape formed by a hang, hanging chain which had the ability to support you know quite a high load so the idea here is that the shape of the curve which can carry a certain load when you invert it when you turn it upside down into an arch it can carry that same load to support its own weight with no bending and Hook actually presented these ideas to the Royal Society in 1670 um, and also published some of these ideas well some of these ideas were published after his death um, in addition to these two domes, we there's also a third dome, which is kind of hidden from view, sitting between the outer and inner dome. And Wren created that third dome sitting between them to, pr to provide further structural support. Um, so I think it is really interesting by thinking about these, these new ideas, these contemporary ideas that we're developing about how to apply, again, the idea of utility and usefulness, how to apply kind of, you know, mathematical ideas to kind of practical projects. Um, and while Wren and Hook were aware that this curve was used as a, as a kind of an approximation to that ideal shape, they didn't actually come up with the curve's mathematical formulation. So the equation was actually developed by several great mathematicians later on um, uh, in, into the kind of later 17th century. But I think what I find particularly interesting is that Hooke himself was clear that, you know, based on what, what Keith was saying about, you know, Hooke's priority disputes, he was clear that this that it was his principle about the mechanics of arches that was being used in Wren's designs. And there does not have been, seem to have been a dispute about this, you know, dis despite that kind of long history or that reputation of, of disputing with other scientists. Great, thank you. And again, I think that's a reminder if anyone's in London and, you know, have a chance to go to St. Paul's and just look up again mm. and just do the tours of St. Paul's. Um, there's just so much in the city that we take for granted that was shaped in this period. Um, and it would be great to just kind of look again with fresh eyes. Um, but you mentioned, you know, despite all these grand plans for reshaping the city, actually much of it was rebuilt along the same lines. So what was the reason for that? Were there kind of lots of conflicting interests at play or? practicality really um so other than the kind of beautifying and rebuilding the city there's an urgency to rebuild it um like i said the act for rebuilding the city of london was passed quite quickly and that showed that strong impulse to kind of get london back to business you know this is a very commercial city and wanting to to get back as being that commercial hub and i think this in a way explains why none of the the plans that i've talked about were really followed or partially explains anyway um and why it was was built according to the old foundations. Uh, another important thing is the land that would have needed to have been forfeited in, in order to kind of redesign the city um, along these lines. So property owners soon asserted 
you know, their own rights and began building again on plots along the lines of the previous street pattern. Uh, so because if the city was going to be rebuilt, they didn't want to use their land. And there was actually a court established because some people did have to lose their land. You know, one of the innovations was the widening, widening of streets. So while we might not get those grand boulevards that Ren talked about, there was a thought that these narrow streets had facilitated the spread of fires. So there was a push towards expanding the width of some of the streets in which people had to lose land, had to forfeit land. And there were courts that were set up to try and solve any disputes about this. But, you know, people are trying to advocate for themselves and protect, you know, their own interests as well. And the City of London are also very interested in, in, in getting London back up and running as well. And they also had the right to command that any ground that hadn't been built upon after a certain amount of time could all, could be kind of taken from the, the land and redistributed through a court system in order to encourage the rebuilding. So I think there is this question of urgency that, you know, that that kind of, there's a there's aesthetic kind of impulses versus those kind of practical considerations. Um, and Alex mentions that fires are common in the city in this period, but obviously this one, the scale of this is, is something else. Um, are there eyewitness mm. accounts of people's experience of the fire? Yeah, there's logs, there's, you know, and, and, and you know, they're, they're, they're quite detailed as well, accounts of people jumping out of houses and attempts to extinguish the flames. Um, at the National Archives, we have a lot of letters between statesmen because we've got to think about this as uh, as a significant international, you know, news event. You know, people writing about this around the world and reporting what it in, in newspapers uh, around the world. And so there's a lot of diplomats talking about this as the saddest destruction that ever did befall to England. Uh, and so news spreads across the world of, of the destruction of London and. I think when we think of the Great Fire, we always think of Samuel Pepys. So Pepys is perhaps the most kind of full, substantial account we get. He does it over a few days and it paints a very colourful and quite chaotic picture uh, of what's happening in London at the time. So really from Pepys, we get a sense of panic, um, of the kind of gradual advance of flames. You know, it starts up with him being kind of woken up in the middle of night and actually going back to bed because he didn't think it was that significant. Uh, and then waking up again and seeing that London was really a light. Uh, and he talks about, you know, citizens fleeing, many on the riverside that are throwing themselves and their goods into boats. Uh, and also comments quite negatively on people kind of saving their belongings over uh, stopping the fire that people had their priorities wrong. Um, but also from Peeps we get, it's quite emotional, his account. You know, he talks about, you know, him nearly weeping when he sees it and talks about the physical strength of the fire, uh, about his face almost being burnt by um, showers of fire drops um, and, and talks about the fire as this kind of most malicious um, horrid flame. So I think it, it, you can really see from Peeps that it did have a kind of an emotional impact of him. And I think on many other people, just seeing a city being burnt to cinders. Um, thanks, Philippa. Um, and I think that's just a, a, such a great illustration of how vividly this period can come to life through the archives and through the work in diaries and archives mm -hmm. um, and objects. Um, and we're now going to look at, so this was a quite distinct, you mentioned there that, you know, this is, this makes news around the world. Um, Alex is now going to talk to us about how London became increasingly outward looking in its approach to the world during the time period that we cover in the gallery. Over to Alex. A rare astronomical event presented mathematicians and natural philosophers with an opportunity to answer a really fundamental but as yet unanswered question. How big is the solar system? Edmund Halley of Comet fame had pointed out this opportunity in 1716. The event was the transit of Venus. So this is when the orbit of Venus takes it between the Earth and the Sun and appears as a small black dot on the face of the Sun from the perspective of Earth. Halley had described how if you accurately timed the passage of this black dot across the surface of the Sun from different points on the Earth's surface, you could mathematically calculate the distance of the Earth from the Sun. Despite the advanced warning, the Royal Society hadn't made many plans to observe the 1761 event, but fearing being outdone by the French, um, they set about coordinating a number of observations of the 1769 event. Of these, the most significant was the first voyage of James Cook, later to be Captain Cook, um, who set out for the Pacific island of Tahiti in 1768. Cook and his team were equipped with a number of instruments made by London's instrument makers for making their observations. 
A telescope like this one, made by maker James Short, was equipped with a heliometer for making precise observations of the passage of Venus across the face of the Sun. They had a regulator clock for accurate timings and a quadrant for measuring altitudes. When the observations of the transit were complete, Cook opened a secret envelope of instructions that he'd been issued by the Admiralty. This tasked him to continue his expedition and to circumnavigate the globe and to search for the southern continent, which was supposed to exist but hadn't yet been mapped. He was tasked to claim it for Britain. This shows the ways in which the scientific agenda of voyages like Cook's and their imperial drivers were closely intertwined. So thank you, Alex, for that and for all the fantastic presentations this evening. We're now going to be rejoined by Professor Simon Schaffer, who we heard from at the start of the evening, to talk a little bit more about the links between science, global expansion and imperialism. So welcome back, Simon. Um, so, um, Simon, as Alex said in the video, science and empire are very closely intertwined. Um, so it was never just about an astronomical observation, was it? That was just a motivator for some, some wider wider plans. Um, could you talk us a little bit more about that first voyage of James Cook and in some of the ways that that astronomical voyage related to Britain's colonial interests? Um, maybe we could start with how it was funded. Who, who paid for that voyage? <clears throat> Yes, I mean, as Alex explained, uh, the putative function of the expedition to Tahiti in 1768, 1769, was to observe the transit of Venus across the face of the sun. I mean, one thing to remember is that uh, they wanted to make those measurements because they wanted to have a better value for the distance between the Earth and the sun. And that value itself had really important implications for the ability to act at a distance, for long range travel. Because if you know that value more accurately, you can make better tables of the position of the moon. And with tables of the position of the moon, you can, in principle at least, produce an almanac that predicts where the moon will be each night. And if you can carry that almanac with you and you have a reasonably accurate way of measuring your local time, then you can determine where you are on the surface of the earth. Notably, you can measure your longitude. That's called the lunar distance method. So what we might think of as the longitude package, which was established in London and Greenwich in the 1760s involving very robust, very highly precise instruments, plus what was called the Nautical Almanac, that allowed much faster, much more reliable voyages, both in peace and war, both for conquest and trade. So even the transit of Venus on its own contributed to the ways in which British naval power began to be exerted globally. And then beyond that, again, as Alex reminded us, there was the view taken by some of the leading hydrographers and geographers in Western Europe that there must exist a great southern continent. I mean, one reason why it was supposed that there must exist a great southern continent was simply to balance the vast amount of land in the northern hemisphere that's a pretty specious reason but there were other reasons to suppose that there were lands unknown to europeans in oceania in the pacific not only that but of course it's extremely important to remember that the pacific was inhabited it was in it was inhabited by one of the great navigating and trading peoples of the world. And this was already reasonably well known to Europeans, and in particular to the Spanish Empire, which controlled a large proportion of the eastern coast of the Pacific, and which imagined the Pacific, fascinatingly, as something like a Spanish lake. So the entry of the British and the French fleets into the Pacific in the middle of the 18th century 
is of great geopolitical significance for trade, for inquiry, for conquest, um, but it's also going to be highly contested. And um, I think that's an important theme to remember when we're thinking about the significance of Cook's first voyage of 1768. Um, and that first voyage, why, why was Tahiti chosen as, as the destination? So again, let's think about the Venus transit. Um, there will be for each transit places on Earth from which one can see the beginning of the transit. So when the planet begins its path across the sun, and there will be places where you see it exiting from the face of the sun, what gave sites like Tahiti their unusually privileged status as far as the London mathematicians were concerned was that you could time the entire transit. You could see the entry and the exit. Um, and that meant at least this was the hope that you could derive the time that Venus seemed to take to cross the face of the sun with extreme accuracy. That accuracy would rely on the precision and robustness of the hardware that Endeavour was carrying. <clears throat> it would rely on the skill of the observers who were going to be shipped from England to Tahiti. And it would rely above all, it's a theme in British history, one cannot escape, it would rely on the weather. And the combination of those factors, together with, again, let's not forget this, the security of the site of observation, so that um, it was exceptionally important, so Cook had been told, that he should fortify the observatory that he was going to build. Right? And indeed he did. He called the site on Tahiti, from which the transit was observed at the start of June of 1769, he called that Fort Venus. And the military security, there was a troop of Marines on board, with which these observational sites were defended, became extremely significant too. Um, and with that, there is... Um... There is an astronomical quadrant on display in the gallery, um, and there is a story that the quadrant, which was essential to astronomical observations, went missing before the before the transit. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that story? Yes, the uh, quadrant that Cook and his collaborators had brought did indeed go missing. Um, there are several aspects of that story that we can now recover from the archives, from the journals and log books that were kept by members of the expedition that are extremely telling. The first and most striking of them is that it was assumed by Banks, sorry, by Cook and his uh, closest collaborators that the quadrant had been taken by sailors on board the boat in order to trade with the Tahitians. Uh, for various valuable items. Uh, it rapidly emerged that the quadrant had not been taken by British sailors, but by a group of Tahitians. And one of Cook's uh, most elegant and sophisticated co-travellers, Joseph Banks, great Lincolnshire landlord, a naturalist, antiquarian, um, went after the quadrant in rather the way one could imagine Banks pursuing poachers on his Lincolnshire estate with his 12 bore gun and so on. Eventually the quadrant was recovered. It had been damaged. It was fixed partly by the work of a technician called Hermann Spöring, who'd been brought along on the expedition by Banks and at his expense as a clock repairer. Um, and while the quadrant stayed somewhat damaged, it seemed at least to Cook and Banks 
and the astronomer Charles Green, who was the specialist astronomer on board, that it was still good enough to use. That would become part of the debate about the quality of the observations later on after the voyage. So I think um, one of the things I, I would really want to emphasize is that um, European chroniclers tend to stress perhaps excessively um, the way in which these devices were taken. I think it's at least as interesting to ask what they were taken to be by the Polynesians. Um, this was a highly sophisticated maritime navigational culture of great complexity, which well understood the importance of trade, of exchange, and of gift giving. And one of the ways I think we need to understand the encounter between the British and the Tahitians at this moment is of complicated understandings of what have been called entangled objects, objects which are understood as trade goods or gift goods, and where notions like theft don't necessarily travel across a cultural boundary. Um, and in that, I mean, you've, you've mentioned the boundaries that the that the Europeans set up in terms of essentially fortifying the the observation site. Um, so, was there any much evidence of exchange in in knowledge between the Europeans and the Tahitians? Um, and in, and were there Europeans? Was, yeah, I mean, there was very significant knowledge exchange. There, or rather, one might say there was very significant gifting of decisive knowledge from the Polynesians to the British. This is uh, to think about, I think, one of the most fascinating figures in this episode, uh, Tupaya, who was a navigator and priest uh, from the island of Rayatea, which is the second largest island of the Tahiti archipelago. Um, Tahiti uh, itself was in a state of social unrest and a certain amount of conflict at this time. Um, Tupaya had clearly been involved in some of those conflicts. He very rapidly, through 1769, established himself as an extraordinary important consultant and informant for the British. One of Cook's midshipmen calls him a man of outstanding genius. And one reason why Cook's crew and Cook and Banks for sure understood him as a man of genius was because of his navigational and technical knowledge. So during 1769, there are a series of exchanges between Tupia and Cook, notably, about mapping the whole of the South Pacific. And this generated, I think, one of the most extraordinary mid 18th century documents that we have, which is a map of a vast area of the Pacific extending as far east as what the Europeans call Easter Island, Rapa Nui, and as far north as Hawaii, Wahoo, and so on. That's uh, an area thousands of miles in extent from north to south and east to west. And it reveals the kind of navigational knowledge that Tupia possessed. Recent studies of the map and of the records of making the map have, I think, brilliantly shown us um, that what was going on was a kind of cross-cultural translation that Tupia was engineering between British and Polynesian notions of scale, of navigation, of how you sight on the North Star, of how you uh, determine the position of the sun at noon, and then correlate that with the longitude package that the British themselves were beginning to use. So as a moment of encounter, and exchange and exploitation and technical debate on the quarter deck of endeavor 
that's a pretty remarkable moment, I think, in cross-cultural knowledge and knowledge production. Um, so, and yes, yeah, so something that you've mentioned there, encounter, exchange, exploitation, and even in this one story, in this one voyage, there are clearly so many complex legacies from the scientific and imperial interests. Um, now, this is far too big for us to, to try and understand in, in a conversation today, but perhaps you could maybe mention some scholars that audiences might want to look up um, if, if they're interested in learning some more. Yes, I mean, I would certainly uh, recommend finding out more about Tupia. There are some very recent biographies. Um, I'd also mention the significance and complexity of what Joseph Banks was doing. Um, he had a series of really important collaborators. Um, the artist Sidney Parkinson, um, Hermann Spurring, the technician who I've mentioned, and the brilliant Swedish naturalist Daniel Solander, who was on board. One reason to emphasize their work is because it speaks to what's going to happen next, which is on the one hand, the intensification and extension of what's been called economic botany. That's to say the identification of commercially useful products for Europeans identified, named, classified, extracted and transplanted from sites like the South Pacific and elsewhere globally. Uh, one story with which we're very familiar is the breadfruit story. Breadfruit is indigenous to Tahiti and other Polynesian islands and banks fairly swiftly recognized that the apparent capacity of breadfruit to provide cheap, reproducible food, the clue is in the name, bread, fruit, um, could be used for uh, what to our eyes is the most appalling and most ghastly and most exploitative aspect of British colonial economy at this period, the slave trade. So Banks's project was to organize the transplantation of breadfruit from Polynesia to the Caribbean, to the West Indies, where he proposed it could be used as food for enslaved people on plantations. And as is well known, I guess, a voyage was dispatched in the late 1780s from Britain into the Polynesian archipelago to Tahiti under the command of William Bly, commander of HMS Bounty, to take breadfruit from Tahiti to the West Indies. We know what happened to Bounty, thanks to the mutiny and the mutineers, but eventually that transplantation happened. So one thing to think about is the immense importance, I think, of these voyages for transplantation and global bioeconomy. Um, which has become such a crucial feature of global modernity now. Thank you, Simon. And I think that's a really striking and searing illustration of how we often, we, we're often taught science as a series of abstract principles, but of course it's been so intertwined with the world we live in today, with the city of London, as we can see in the gallery. Um, before we let you go, Simon, um, I just want to introduce someone who has a very special message for you this evening. Um, I'd like to welcome to the screen the chair of the Science Museum Group, Dame Mary Archer. Over to you, Mary. How about that? Uh, there we go. Okay, so sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Ali, um, and thank you, panel, for a most wonderful discussion. Um, I interrupt this terrific evening for the best of evening, for the best of reasons. So, um, 
we celebrated, the Science Museum uh, celebrated its centenary back in 2009. And as part of those celebrations, we created um, our fellowship program to honor very distinguished individuals with fellowship of the museum. And over the years since then, um, we have acquired um, a group of fellows who add great luster to the Science Museum group. And this evening, um, I have the honor to make a virtual presentation of a fellowship to your panelist, Simon Schaffer. So if I may just briefly embarrass you, Simon, and um, entertain the rest of the uh, audience, I'd like to briefly say why you are so special to us at the Science Museum. So Simon has been instrumental in the transformation of the Science Museum over the past decade. He's helped us to reposition the organization in terms of the importance of its collection and our understanding of its importance uh, to the history of science and beyond. He's provided extraordinary levels of support to many gallery and exhibition projects, among them information, age, making the modern world, robots, our exhibition on robots, and our exhibition on the sun. Uh, Simon, um, as a member of the Science Museum Advisory Board, has always been extraordinarily generous with his time in reviewing exhibition text, and he's been a regular star in our public events, as indeed uh, you are this evening, Simon. And with his enormous knowledge, encyclopedic knowledge, um, of the history of science and its material culture, Simon has also suggested many promising avenues of research and collections to us and our curators. And he's helped to build the curator's team's contacts with academia. Actually, he's been personally responsible for training quite a large proportion of our curatorial team, either as a teacher, a doctoral supervisor, or an examiner. So throughout all of this, uh, Simon, you've provided steadfast encouragement for individuals, projects, and the museum itself, providing an intellectual input that others can only envy and admire. So we are hugely indebted to you for your enduring and steadfast support for our work and for our ambition. So, um, Simon, it's the end of an era when you step down from the Science Museum Advisory Board, and I hope you will accept, as it were, a virtual fellowship scroll. The real one will follow um, to um, your, your room in Cambridge. Um, and um, we have been so uh, blessed to have you as an associate all these years. And you know, nobody ever really leaves the Science Museum, so don't think you'll entirely escape us. Well, thank you very much, Mary. That's embarrassing, as you uh, hinted. Um, I think it's rather delightful to be an acquisition of the Science Museum, <laughs> because I'm desperately hoping that I now get to choose which gallery I will be exhibited in. Um, my Making the modern world, surely. Possibly. My experience of the Science Museum, however, is that I'm much more likely to be uh, very carefully wrapped up and put into storage. <laughs> and after several years, it will be recalled that I'm in storage and I'll be brought out for some further centenary exhibition. Anyway, um, two quick comments because I can't resist. One is um, awards like this are, of course, always in a way collective. I do want to pay tribute. I want to back up what you've said about the importance of the curatorial team. I mean, we, we have Alex Rose and Ali Boyle with us this evening, and I think that's a treasure that makes the Science Museum work. And I really and sincerely hope that that can expand, intensify and continue over the coming period. So massive respect to them. And the other comment that I'd make is that uh, the linkage between inquiry, 
exhibition and explanation has always been right at the center of the museum's brief. And I think that's what gives it part of its importance and its unique role. And I'm hugely admiring of the way in which those relations have been secured and maintained under very difficult circumstances sometimes. They're, one of my favorite books is a mid-Victorian, rather slim volume that tended to be given on school prize days. And it was called, great title, The Pursuit of Knowledge Under Difficulties. <laughs> and that I think is perhaps a slogan that we need to bear in mind. But Mary, thank you very much. And thank you, Science Museum. Thank you. And thank you, Ali, for letting me um, interject that. Okay, uh, thank you, Jane Mary. Uh, that was a very welcome gate crashing of the event, I think. Um, thank you, Simon, and huge congratulations for your well-deserved fellowship. Um, as Mary said, you have meant so much to the curatorial team and so much of the work of the Science Museum. I think we'll all agree that's a suitably positive note to end this evening on. So um, a final thank you to all of our speakers this evening, Professor Simon Schaffer, Keith Moore, Dr. Philippa Halliwell, and of course, to our wonderful Science City curator, Alex Rose. I'd also really like to say thank you to the Royal Society who have collaborated with this whole series of events and with the galleries themselves. They would have not been possible without the loans and the support of the Royal Society. Um, I sincerely urge you to see those galleries for yourself if you haven't already. And if you've already been, go and see the galleries again. Um, on to our next virtual event. Um, so our ne next virtual event is actually tomorrow night, uh, something very different. It's the final of our series of global climate talks, and we'll be taking an in-depth look at the outcome of the COP26 climate summit. You'll have seen a lot about that in the news, but you can uh, ha tune into our speakers for a really in-depth look at what actually went on. You'll find details of how to book your ticket, which is free on the Science Museum website. Finally, if you'd like to support the Science Museum group across all of our five museums in the UK, they're free to visit, and we're, our mission is to inspire the next generation of scientists, technicians, engineers, mathematicians, and medics. The next Robert Hooke might be out there somewhere. You can also find a link to make a donation in the description below. That's really all we've got time for this evening. Thank you again to all of our speakers and to all of you at home for watching tonight. Good night. <laughs>